Good morning, everyone. I'm Jan Arwin, head of education at the Ulrich Museum, and we're we're working out a few tech difficulties with Gary this morning. So um, I'll be working behind the scenes to try and get that figured out. Um, but in the meantime, um, I want to thank everyone for joining us this morning uh, for our ongoing series of 10 paired faculty talks taking place during the 23rd faculty biennial. It's all part of the process on view through May 8th. Our galleries are open with safety protocols in place Monday through Saturday, 11 to five. And as always, free to all. Now in its 46th year, the biennial showcases the breadth of creative work and research being undertaken by the faculty of the School of Art, Design and Creative Industries in art history, art education, ceramics, curatorial practice, drawing, graphic design, painting, photography, printmaking, sculpture, and new media. This series of talks on the biennial's theme, it's all part of the process, seeks to prompt reflections and start conversations about each faculty member's personal process, highlighting the diversity of activities that contribute to creative practice from research to studio time to interactions with colleagues and students. I hope you will join us for the next virtual faculty talks on Thursday, March 10th at 10 a.m. with Barry Badgett, Associate Professor of Sculpture Media, and Robert Bell, Foundations Coordinator and Associate Professor of Painting and Drawing. This morning, we welcome Ted Adler and Gary Lincoln. Ted is an artist and potter, primarily working with wood-fired ceramics. He has exhibited work in more than 125 exhibitions throughout the U.S. and abroad, including a solo exhibition at Greenwich House Potteries Jane Hartsook Gallery in New York City, an associate professor of art and area, head of ceramics media at Wichita State University. Ted received his BA from Lewis and Clark College in Portland, Oregon in 1993, and his MFA from Ohio State University in Athens, Ohio in 2002. He also studied with renowned artist Toshiko Takazu, with whom he apprenticed for more than a year in her Quakertown, New Jersey studio. He recently completed an artist in residence at Northern Clay Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota, as a 2019 recipient of a McKnight Artist Residency for Ceramic Artists. Adler has lectured and demonstrated at numerous ceramic centers and universities across the nation, including the Archie Bray Foundation, Red Lodge Clay Center, Aramount, School of Crafts, and the Anderson Ranch Art Center. Gary Lincoln has been a lecturer in ceramics media at WSU since 2013. He received his BS, BS in chemistry with a teaching degree from WSU in 1968 and a master's in education in science and math from WSU in 1974. Over a 38 year career in education, Gary taught high school chemistry, physics, math, and computer science. Gary's work has been exhibited in numerous solo and group exhibitions, and his work is included in the 500 Teapots Volume 2 by Jim Lawton, published in 2013. We will have Ted and Gary present their talks back to back, followed by the Q&A, in which we will give everyone attending permission to turn on your cameras and mics to join the conversation. And please feel free to add your, your questions and comments to the chat box throughout the presentations. And with that, I will turn it over to Ted. Hi, Ted. It's all yours. Hi, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> These some other, other friends, Joanne, Ruth. Thanks, guys, for and everybody else for showing up. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Let's go full screen. Okay. Um, so thinking about, you know, it's weird looking at your own work in retrospect and thinking about process. Um, so what I want to do is just kind of peel back the curtain a little bit on a few different elements uh, of the idea of process in my work and my career. So I'm going to throw it back uh, about 20 years. The work that I've made over the last 20 years or so uh, has been centered around the sculptural vessel, uh, especially in terms of uh, its metaphorical and relational connections to uh, the body and ideas of selfhood. So all of these works, uh, for the most part, uh, the work that I've made over the last 20 years, 
focus on the use of stoneware, and these are all fired using um, sort of a traditional uh, wood fire technique. Uh, most of these surfaces are uh, developed through the uh, deposit of ash at high temperatures um, in a wood fire kiln. Uh, beginning on the wheel, now most of the work is, is wheel thrown. Uh, it's one of the, the primary tools that I've used, but uh, later works uh, like the ones you just saw uh, were finished with coils. So there was a bit of a hand building um, aspect to the, the process of making these. So moving on and off of the wheel um, at various stages of the development um, to get to the final form. Uh, and here's a little bit of the, the wood fired uh, surface uh, uh, in, in action. Um, it's a pretty sexy process, uh, but pretty labor intensive, which is satisfying too. Um, but after, you know, I guess 20 years of working this way and thinking these, uh, these ideas, um, I guess what I would say is that I began to want to um, develop a, a new connection or to reconnect with, um, with the work on an emotional level, if that makes sense. When we think about processes, you know, processes uh, need space. They need head space, but they also need physical space. Um, so in uh, 2019, I had the opportunity to take a sabbatical, which, uh, you know, is the um, primary way that faculty can kind of refresh themselves, recharge their batteries, and come back to their teaching practice um, with, uh, with relevant, hopefully, ideas. And, uh, and good energy. So to help me do that, I was able to uh, work with uh, Wichita Open Studios uh, run by Elizabeth Stevenson from Fish House. So this is the Garvey Center, uh, Wichita's second tallest building and probably its most iconic in terms of its uh, imprint on our, our cityscape. Um, but down in the basement, I wasn't in that fancy uh, penthouse area up there, but uh, down in the basement, uh, I had a small space and I thought, you know, for, for this uh, beginning, this process of, of reconnecting to the work, I really wanted to have a clear space uh, mentally as well as physically. So the only things that I brought in with me, um, maybe a, a couple of spare tools, but primarily just a work surface and the clay. Um, and so beginning from there, leaving the wheel behind um, and, and familiar tools, really wanting to re-engage uh, with that freshness, um, I began hand building uh, and coiling uh, works. Uh, the vessel still sort of figuring pretty prominently, but uh, at this point, not not relying on a firing process for the surface, but rather the material itself. So this is a um, this is a mid range porcelain. So this is fired to a much lower temperature. Uh, when I say much lower, I mean by two or three hundred degrees uh, lower temperature than the um, the wood fire works. Um, so there's really no possibility of these being you know engaging that process, making sort of a break. And then also considering uh, ideas of interiority and, uh, and the space of the vessel, um, you know, basically playing around. Um, but still with the, the idea that the, the, the character of the surface of these works really comes from the, um, the quality of the material itself. So rather than putting it through a firing process to uh, develop the surface uh, imagery, really relying on the, the clay and uh, some inclusions in it. Um, these are some of the materials that I that I wedge into the clay uh, separately. Uh, so you know, this way, when people tell me that I'm dumber than a box of rocks, I can say, nope, I've got a box of rocks, and I'm at least that smart. Uh, so these are this is some of the aggregate material, uh, which are range in size from call it a coarse sand to uh, to really gravel. Um, and so what these uh, these inclusions do as the clay shrinks. Right, it tends to crack around uh, these rocks and open up fissures in the, the surface of the, the clay itself. Um, so there's a, a surface texture, but also um, what it helps do for me is raise the idea of the, the permeability of the vessel wall, right? That, that as a container, this is a permeable container so that it contains, and yet it's also uh, accessible uh, through more than, than simply the, uh, the opening at the top. And uh, one thing that I discovered with this porcelain uh, this is this is really probably the closest that clay comes to being glass, and so it's also permeable to light, and so for me that was really kind of a thrill to to discover this about the material and uh, and the, the potential that it has for um, sort of talking about uh, that idea of interiority that interests me uh, so much. 
Uh, as Jana mentioned, I uh, received a grant to go and do a residency at the Northern Clay Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, it was also really cold, not as cold as this last snap, but boy, it was pretty cold. Um, so uh, process needs space, but it also needs time. And uh, that was the gift that my family gave me um, to be able to go and do this. Uh, my wife, Brenda, uh, who many of you know and love, uh, not as much as me though, um, was holding down the fort at home. And because of the grant, I was able to travel back and forth. It's about a 10 hour drive. Um, so I put a few miles on the, the truck, but um, I had about three months here uh, to develop a body of work. And so continuing that exploration of uh, the porcelain, uh, I started creating these, these, um, these new vessels uh, that I call uh, coupled vessels. And so if, if you, you know, consider the work that I was making prior to this, there's really sort of the vessel as a single aperture opening at the top. And so here we have, you know, essentially two vessels that have two entry points and yet the space inside is sort of a shared space. And so uh, thinking about ideas along those lines, but I've also uh, kind of refined the use of that aggregate material. So these rocks, you can really see, you know, how some of them really kind of melt out. They're primarily, primarily feldspar, which is kind of a, um, if you think of it, a, um, an, uh, a form of granite that's free of impurities. And so uh, a little more of a, a white on white kind of effect here. Um, for my thinking process, you know, anytime, you know, the pendulum swings one way, I, I try to think of, you know, where that might end up on the other end of the swing. Uh, and so, you know, also likewise, not wanting to uh, get stuck in using one material to, uh, to accomplish my ideas. So here we see the ideas working themselves out in, uh, in a, a dark stone or really a black stone where fired to the same temperature. Um, an idea that's been sort of uh, budding in my mind slowly over time, maybe the last couple of years, I had a chance to kind of uh, begin some preliminary uh, explorations of other clay bodies. And uh, just really briefly, you know, my interest in the, the character of the material itself and what that is able to uh, communicate or what I'm able to express through that, um, you know, using clay bodies of different colors and different qualities um, to sort of achieve something that touches on the idea of um, sort of the medicine of antiquity, where there was the understanding that, that our, our physical health was dependent on four humors, right? Or I should say our physical and mental health. And so this is blood, phlegm, green bile, and black bile. And so these antiquated uh, you know, medicinal notions sort of pointing out our, um, our imperfect understanding of, of ourselves and our bodies and how things work in the way that um, clay bodies can kind of touch on some of those things through uh, elements of color and form. Um, I show you this series of images in the development of the work. So uh, what I'm doing here is I'm adding coils gradually and building up the form. And uh, the idea was to make four identical forms out of four different clay bodies. And as I was progressing along this path, I, I felt you know, everything was going along pretty well. I was having good success, things were looking alike, and uh, the forms were looking pretty solid. But by the time I got to the end, um, I really felt like uh, I hadn't achieved my goal of reconnecting with the work on an emotional level. It was still a little bit too cerebral, I guess I would say. So I scrapped all of these. So this was a better part of a week. And when we talk about process and the creative process, you know, achieving your goals does not uh, always equate to success. So for me, I had a chance to kind of um, to re reimagine um, what I wanted out of the work and maybe drop back a little bit and approach things a little more simply um, in terms of uh, form and also content, really wanting to, um, to sort of let go a little bit of, of some of the, um, I guess I would say ideas. I mean, the ideas are still there, but, but letting the, the material sort of lead the way to get to those ideas rather than the idea leading the way. And so uh, what I've done is I've really sort of scaled back a little bit in terms of uh, the complexity of the form, uh, still using you know, the materials and trying to exploit those. You can see the image on the, the right there, you can see a lot of really detailed information about uh, the material the, in terms of its malleability and its, uh, the cracking and the fissures that start to happen and the inclusions. But at the same time, you start to see real details of my handprint and even down to the um, the details of my fingerprints, right? So there's a lot of information about 
my hands uh, as the maker in that. Um, and that's really where it is right now. I think, uh, you know, it's really an exploratory phase for me in terms of uh, the process of developing my work over time. Uh, it's also uh, an exploratory process in terms of materials and my making process uh, and exploring the, the qualities of the materials, uh, not just in terms of the different types of clays that I use, but also the states of the clay. So, um, so using a softer and softer clay that is more and more receptive to the marks that I want to make. But, um, you know, in doing that, it really loses a lot of the structural uh, integrity. So the softer the clay is, the, the less able it is to, to resist the pull of gravity. And um, what, I, what I really come to, uh, to try to embrace in this stage of my making uh, and my practice is that, uh, that the making process, need, for me, needs to be a learning process. And, uh, and learning involves risk. So uh, when I consider, you know, the work that I'm doing now and the risks that I want to take, one of the things that I have to embrace is that real risk involves the possibility of actual failure. <laughs> and this is, uh, you know, this is maybe uh, the, the less talked about part of the creative process, but failure, right? This is the, uh, the, the clay collapsing under its own weight. It's simply too soft and I'm building too quickly. Uh, moving the form along to, to create the, uh, uh, the volume and the textures uh, through making and keeping that freshness, and it simply isn't holding up. So there's been, been quite a bit of this uh, happening in my studio, um, but with just enough success to, um, to get me through to the next stage of the, the process. Um, this is where things are, and the, uh, the works that I showed you previously here, um, these are awaiting... Uh, inspection uh, they're in a kiln right now that i have yet to unload so this is uh, this is about as up to date as it gets in my process and so uh, with that i will leave you and pass you on to gary thanks so much for coming everybody. Hi, Gary. Are you ready to roll? Gary. Yes. Yes, I am. So how, how okay. So uh, Okay, I'm having trouble, Jana, getting on the screen. I've, I've, I've got my video going, I think you can see. We can see you. So if you click on share screen at the bottom. Ah, got it. You got okay. it. And then click on... Uh, where do I go now? Should, should you can I... you can select your PowerPoint. Oh so well, okay, I can do one that. One of your options, and then there's a blue button that says Share Screen after you select your PowerPoint. Right. There you go. Okay. Well done. Gary's not a robot. I'm not a robot, uh, but I don't see my PowerPoint. For all those you who are listening, I'm sorry. I'm uh, digitally uh, ignorant. Hey, Gary. Yes, sir. Go back to uh, share screen. It gives you a. Did you select the screen that you intended to select? Uh, let's see. But hey, Gary, why don't you go ahead and stop share, and then and then we'll start over. <laughs> <laughs> We've done this before. I can't do too much because this computer, this 
Well, or you could do it this way. You could open your PowerPoint. Okay, I thought I had done that. Uh, that should be open now. There we go. There's my PowerPoint. There you go. Okay. So Well, it looks like we lost Gary. Just give us a minute. We'll see if we can get him back on. Ted, while we're waiting, if you want to pop on, we've got a question in the um, Q&A. You could address it while we're waiting on Gary to come back. Oh. Hi, Gary. What happened? I have no idea. <laughs> All right. Let's... And so, uh, so all I see is Ted Adler, and I want me. We've got you. I can see you. So go ahead and hit share screen. All right. And PowerPoint. Uh huh. Okay. Awesome. All right. So I've got the PowerPoint, but people can't see me yet. We can see you, Gary. Oh, you can? Uh huh. Oh, perfect. Well, I hope you can hear me too. We can uh, hear I you. I put together for this little talk. Uh, many people don't know my history. Uh, um, and, and maybe unfortunately many people do, but in any case, um, I thought that I would start from the beginning and um, this, um, this pot was my very, well, if I discount my elementary school experience with clay, which I have very little recollection uh, of, um, my, my girlfriend at this time, uh, who I met through a blind date, um, taught uh, at John Marshall, taught art at John Marshall Junior High. And uh, I was at the time um, subbing in the school district. And so I don't feel bad about this, but anyway, Diane, Thomas brought me a couple of pounds of red earthenware, which I then proceeded to uh, hand build uh, this pot. And, I, and I'm gonna call this my first pot. <clears throat> and I, <clears throat> after looking at Ted's video, excuse me, <clears throat> after looking at Ted's video, I see some similarities in the surface, but um, this was done in 1973. So I think Ted mentioned that he was uh, maybe about eight years old at that time. But in any case, um, my first pot, red earthenware, which I've always really liked. Although, as you will see as we go through, uh, I've experimented or uh, explored other surfaces and other uh, firing methods. So uh, because I became very interested in clay, I started to pursue that interest. And I first took a class at um, uh, um, Art, the Artists Association. And uh, I had uh, Terry Akins as an instructor um, who was a really, really um, in influential and a nice person and helped me a lot uh, during that semester uh, at, at, uh, at the center. 
I then took a class there from a grad student and um, he, 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 uh, uh, he was very instrumental in, 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 uh, in helping me also. And when he graduated, he's a very good teacher and uh, a really good potter. And so I said, whoa, I, uh, I, I really like this. I'm going to get an advanced degree and teach at the university level. Well, um, my, uh, and, I'm, and I'm having a hard time recalling his name, but in any case, I may come with it, up with it here in a moment. But in any case, when he graduated, he, with all these attributes, he couldn't get a job right away. And so uh, I said, well, okay, I'll stick with teaching science and math, and, uh, which I did. But I also continued to pursue ceramics and uh, eventually came to WSU um, with Rick St. John and started with him. And this is a picture um, that uh, is a stoneware pitcher um, with, uh, with a cone 10, a cone 10 clay body, and of course a cone 10 um, glaze. Um, in any case, uh, I, I still have this pitcher. It's about 13 inches tall. And uh, many of you probably know Lars Volz. Uh, who is a good friend of mine. He was a grad student. In fact, um, I spent time in his class for a semester uh, getting familiar with that beginning ceramics class. But in any case, he saw this picture and said to me, when you die, I'd really like to have that picture. Well, so if we look inside that picture, um, there's a note indicating that Lars should end up with this uh, particular piece uh, at, at what some eventual event, <laughs> at least to me. Uh, so in any case, continuing on, uh, this is another um, uh, stoneware piece that I, that I constructed uh, uh, under the tutelage of Rick St. John. Uh, this is about uh, 15 inches tall, um, about 10 inches or so uh, wide, uh, it's a lidded jar, obviously. And um, one of my favorite pieces besides that picture uh, from that time, which would have been um, 19, uh, 1974, five and six, when I was working out there um, trying to learn the trade. Um, this is a casserole, and in my, my uh, world of famous casserole, um, uh, this was also um, under the tutelage of Rick St. John. And Rick went to Alfred and knew Val Cushing well and invited uh, Professor Cushing down to um, visit with us. Uh, it was in the summertime. And uh, in any case, um, I put this particular piece, it's a casserole, it's about 12, 13 inches wide and about seven inches tall. And I've used it several times, it works really well and I've had several compliments on, compliments on it. But with that said, um, Val Cushing, Cushing um, really panned it and didn't like it at all. So I, have, I, I don't have a real good feeling about Val, although I know he was very instrumental. In fact, I've used some of his glazes myself. So God rest his soul, uh, I still like this casserole. Well, it was kind of a couplet there, but in any case, um, uh, a further exp uh, exploration in stoneware and glazes at the time. Well, so um, push comes to shove, and I became, I was teaching at Bishop Carroll and continued my ceramic study and uh, night or summer classes at the time. Uh, and I just got bogged down with working and being a department chair in the science department at Bishop Carroll High School. Um, and then I, after six years there, I uh, started a carpentry business and did that for uh, three years. Well, I was working almost seven, 
24 uh, and had no time for ceramics. And after those three years, I joined the faculty at Southeast High School in the math department and taught math at Southeast for 22 years. I, I, uh, I fortunately figured out that I should do, take a sabbatical that was available to teachers in 259. So that's what I did. I uh, applied for a sabbatical and got permission to do that. And I spent an incredible semester at Wichita State in um, uh, uh, advanced drawing class with Robert Buck, um, the um, ceramics class with David Hiltner and um, a sculpture class, which was, I found very, very, um, I don't know, eventful, but uh, in, in educating with Barry Badgett. Um, so uh, I, at that point, got into ceramics. And uh, before I did that sabbatical, um, the semester before that, I took a materials class from David Hiltner, which was a great class. Uh, and it got me back in to the ceramics department after many years and um, got me associated with uh, fellow students and grad students. And many of us became very good friends at that point in time. So with that said, this is a pot from um, a, a, a bit later than that sabbatical. During the sabbatical, I have pretty much made all um, lidded jars. But um, as you can see, I was investigating uh, surface treatment. This is a soda fired uh, vessel about 11 inches tall. Um, a combination of that bottom part is, uh, is clay. Um, and I sprayed it with uh, a flashing slip for the soda kiln. And uh, then the top part is glazed, but you can see the indentations into the surface, uh, an exploration of manipulating that form and uh, creating my own style. Well, um, after, uh, after uh, uh, working at Wichita State for a while, I um, was um, privy to uh, Ted coming and uh, doing a workshop. He, he was in Arizona, if I remember correctly, and came and did a workshop. And uh, you saw some of his earlier pots in the previous, his presentation. Um, and he uh, would throw pots at that point in time and then use that instrument on the right. It's actually called a paint blender. And he would then push in to the clay and uh, actually have the clay collapse on itself. And so I said, whoa, I haven't gone that far with the uh, clay. So uh, I, I, I didn't have that instrument, but I, my wife who was an artist and an MFA in, in painting, uh, I described this tool and asked her if she knew about it and she didn't know. So anyway, I found some uh, uh, appropriate um, foam material and that I built this uh, uh, instrument that's the second one from the left um, and then I drilled a hole in it and put a dowel in it and showed it to Diane my wife at the time uh, by the way that blind date turned into a marriage so anyway um, she said oh I have one of those and um, so that's where I got that instrument on the right and the, the uh, little cherry stick um, to the very left is a, a piece that I fashioned out of cherry wood. And I used that to make the addition, uh, initial indentations into the clay. And you can see that pot on the upper right um, and some of the results of pushing that clay in further than I was, than I was used to. Um, from there, uh, this is, a, I think, a very good example of uh, treatment of that clay surface. This is a earthenware pot. It's about 11 inches. No, it's not that tall. It's about 10 inches tall. Um, uh, 
and I used that tool and pushed it in and got into the pot and pushed out those areas that are bulging out. Um, and then the surface, um, excuse me, I have to deal with my little dog. Um, that surface is terra sigillata, which is a very, very thin, fine particle clay. And uh, that's covered the surface. And then I burnish that with either a plastic bag, my fingers, or a microfiber cloth. All of those work pretty well. But I normally use uh, actually a Dillon's bag that those brown Dillon's bags seem to be pretty hard uh, in terms of the plastic. And it does a very good job with, with polishing those surfaces. And so at a low temperature, um, and this is earthenware fired at cone 04, which is about 1940 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, um, which is a relatively low temperature for clay in terms of producing a finished product. Um, but with that low temperature, the sheen on that uh, surface then remains. And so that's why uh, that surface looks as it does. Um, I think this pot um, is uh, about 2008 or so after Ted's influence and pushing in that clay. This is stoneware, a stoneware lidded jar. And um, it has a round bottom, so it won't stand up by itself, upright in any case. And so um, during these uh, productions, I made several of these and uh, made wooden uh, bases for them. Um, I found the wood out in, in the wood lot at school at WSU. And uh, this, these were some um, uh, pallet uh, uh, pieces, uh, which was um, very um, um, figurative. And I thought did a good job in combination uh, and showing off this particular work. Uh, I want you to note the black um, uh, glaze on that surface, which I added to that, which, um, well, uh, some people didn't, thought that that was too much. I've always liked it. So uh, I, I, I maintained it at least that desire to uh, place that sort of mark on pots and we'll come back to that mark, uh, marking process uh, as you will see later on. Uh, here are some other um, pieces. These are of course mugs. Uh, this was, uh, if you look uh, closely at each of those uh, handles, you see that they're a little bit different, how they come up off of the pot, how they uh, attach to the pot. Um, and so um, my whole, life with ceramics has been an exploration. Um, I, I didn't go to uh, grad school in ceramics and I, I, I think maybe it's a little tough for me to follow Ted uh, because he's, he's such an expert and, and knowledgeable in the ceramic world. Um, and uh, I actually often go to him for, for advice. But in any case, um, these are some other explorations and these are stoneware. Um, soda fired at cone 10, which is about 2340 degrees Fahrenheit, getting pretty warm. So um, this next image is a, a bowl. It's about 13, 14 inches wide. This was in a show at City Arts with uh, Joe Goodwin. Um, he, he put this together. I think he called this Joe's Swan Song. But anyways, they, he invited uh, several artists to participate and that downstairs floor was filled with uh, pieces from the artists that he uh, invited to be in the show. Um, in any case, um, with, the, with the bowls, I found that making those marks on the inside of the bowl, I, I tried on the outside and made several of those, but I think this works much better you can see those in undulations and you can see the push up from the bottom of the bowl and making those bulges and, and, and um, uh, making those Im impressions more revealing. So 
on and upward, we have a picture of a um, teapot. I made several of these teapots. Um, I, if I like, I one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, uh, a little more than 10 pieces of uh, different clay went together in putting this teapot together. And it's one of my favorite forms uh, because it involves so much information and so much thought in where to put things and what things to put. But anyway, um, as Jana mentioned in the intro, uh, I have a, a teapot and I believe it's this one that's uh, published in uh, the second edition of 500 Teapots um, by Lark Press. Um, any case, I have maybe one of these left. I've made several and they're out in the world. So uh, I'm, I'm very happy that other people uh, can enjoy my work and do enjoy apparently. Um, this is another piece, this is a planter. This is about 11 inches wide and about eight inches tall. Um, this is a, also earthenware, low fire cone 04 uh, with um, a glaze. Um, it's not quite a celadon looking glaze and it wouldn't be because it's a low fire glaze. Uh, but anyway, it was another exploration into uh, manip manipulating that clay surface. Um, and then another one of those pots. Um, and this is also earthenware, Kono 4. Um, and I sprayed black glaze on this. This is all one piece. It looks like it's sitting on a, on a stand, which I have done, but this is all one piece. Anyway, I glazed this with a black glaze and then uh, borrowed the sculpture areas um, sandblaster and sandblasted this and that's why that surface is dull and you can see some of the the clay uh, shining through that um, and I and I and I I'm very fond of this piece uh, uh, although I don't have it anymore but I get to look at it here um, and uh, during this time I was very interested in um, uh, exploring different forms uh, I looked at a lot of different pots, um, antique pots, uh, old pots, um, Minoan pots, Egyptian pots, etc. And I got a lot of ideas and I also looked at other ceramic artists' work. Um, and and uh, a lot of us, if not all of us, steal. We steal ideas. Um, and we if we just reproduce what we've looked at and stolen, then that's not the way to go. But if it influences you and helps you along and maybe gives you another idea to work with. Um, and, and for the, this pot that you see on the screen now was a, a complete invention of mine um, it, and it worked out very well. But I've also made other things like baskets. This is uh, also earthenware. Uh, cone 04 with terra sigillata on the bottom, which uh, I put on and then burnished as I described earlier. And then of course it's glazed on the inside and the handle is, is also glazed. Um, this is about 10 inches tall. Um, during this also investigation, I did some wood firing. Uh, Ted is a wood fire. And um, to be truthful with you, I, I, uh, I may be a little old a wood fire. <laughs> it's hard work, it's amazing. If you see a wood fired pot, you know that a lot of work has gone into that. This is making this pot and, and putting the, the slip on it. The slip is just a, a fine um, um, or, or a liquid, uh, water added to clay and then sprayed on. And this is a flashing slip that came out of the uh, train kiln at, at uh, Wichita State. Um, and you can see the flashing and the carbon trapping on that surface. Uh, and uh, this is one of my favorite pots. And at this time, after this was made, I had a show 
um, I think at um, Fiber Studio. And I fired the soda kiln and uh, as I, before I even opened the door of the soda kiln, I heard this popping inside and um, I don't know what went wrong, what went wrong, but a lot of the pots did not survive. survive. It, it was a, a couple of days later, some of those pots were still popping. And so I hadn't intended to include this pot, but I did. And I put a reasonably good price on it for me anyway, and somebody bought it. So I don't have it anymore, but I have, uh, I have access to it and I'm gonna go visit it maybe one of these days. This is another uh, um, uh, uh, exploration in functional. I, I, I am interested in functional pieces. Not all my pieces are actually used in terms of function but uh, I've made pieces that were look like sculpture. And then uh, I've made six or seven, and I have another commission for uh, a, a funerary urn, funeral urn uh, for um, a friend's wife's ashes. And so I'll produce one of those pots that maybe look like a sculpture, but has turned into a functional pot. Um, my present investigation has to do with um, uh, pitchers. This is, a, a, again, an earthenware pitcher. Uh, a student of mine in the basic ceramics class, one of the projects that we do is they have to uh, investigate, explore, and do a paper over a, a historical pot something that occurred or was made before 1900. And then they reproduced that pot using coils. It's one of the, the projects that we do to introduce students to different ways to manipulate clay. And um, so uh, a young woman in my class did a, uh, an Egyptian pot and I was just enamored with the way they formed those, um, those uh, spouts. And so I became very involved with uh, that particular form. And so um, this is a picture uh, inside my studio of several pictures in process. Um, the ones that are uh, dull red are greenware. They've never been fired. They're just dry clay. Uh, and obviously, and, and very fragile. The ones that are a little whiter, brighter red um, are uh, bisque fired and they need to be finished with glaze and, and, and whatever other surface treatment I will put on there. Um, also, I ask you to remember that black um, uh, in, surface that I put on those pots. And I continue to do that and explore that application. And with that, we'll take you to the faculty show. And that is my entry or my entries into that show. These are nested bowls, uh, all earthenware, uh, a white slip, and then the black slip uh, trailed with a, with a brush and then a clear glaze on top of that and fired for the second time. So uh, that's my last slide. And, and by the way, uh, my mustache is not quite as fancy as Ted's, but uh, also I can't really easily take mine off. But any case, there we are. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that and I'm ready for uh, I assume any of us are ready for questions. Thank you, Gary. That was awesome. Ted, do you want to join us? And everyone who's um, who's watching, I'm going to go ahead <laughs> I... slowly, slowly make my way through uh, through all of all of you and give you permission to turn on your cameras and your mics and join the Q and A. Um, and again, if you if you'd rather uh, not turn on your camera. Um, that's fine. <laughs> um, Ted, while, while I'm doing this, um, Don Rogas had a question uh, that he 
put into the Q&A while you were presenting. And he asked, where do you get your favorite clay and what is its makeup? Um, that's a hard question for me to answer, Don. Um, I use a lot of different clays. It's sort of one of the, I don't know if it's self-sabotage or just a, a strategy that I have for discovery. Um, but I very seldom ever use the same clay body twice. Even if I'm using a recipe, it's, it's like when I cook, I never see the recipe. And, and most of the time I get something I like, sometimes I don't. Um, but currently um, the clays that I'm using, it started the, the work. And actually, I, I just want to back up a little bit. Um, the works that I showed the porcelain, uh, the ones that I made at the Garvey Center, uh, those were works that I had in the faculty biennial last time, which is a year and a half ago. Um, and then the works that uh, the couple vessels that I made up in Minneapolis, those are works that are currently in uh, the faculty biennial at the Elbridge this year. And I just wanted to say thank you to the Elbridge and all of the staff and Leslie Brothers for, uh, for hosting it again this year. Those clays, that porcelain was a store-bought, commercially produced clay um, that I used just sort of as a, a departure point or a, a quick quick point of entry into that exploration. But I have since started uh, exploring and developing my own clay body, which is made from a, a, a I wouldn't call it a rare, but a, a very special sort of kale and clay from New Zealand. And it's about the whitest clay you can get your hands on in the U.S. commercial. Um, so I can't, say, I can't say that I have one particular clay uh, that's my favorite, but I do sort of like to explore different clays to kind of uh, extract, you know, some sort of, you know, metaphorical or relational connection to the idea of um, selfhood and the way that we th sort of think of ourselves through the vessel and that sort of thing, if that makes sense. So it's not a... You know, I'm not very good. I mean, I've got a ton of recipes. I can give you a stack, but I don't have one that I like is my go-to. No. Thanks, Ted. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Georgia. Do we have any other questions? I see some uh, people. We, yeah, we, no. we do have a question. Um, um, first question is for Ted. What kind of aggregates do you experiment with? And yeah. two, well, I'll, I'll go ahead and leave that with you, Ted. Yeah, I see that in the, in the, the chat there. Thanks for that question. Um, yeah, so um, my sources are varied. Uh, I'm not above just sort of scooping stuff up off the ground. But right now, uh, a lot of the aggregates that, uh, that I showed are uh, really produced for uh, agricultural industry. So basically chicken grit. Uh, and if you're not familiar, chicken grit is a crushed stone that uh, of various sizes, whether it's for younger chicks or older chickens, that's... Uh, uh, mixed into the feed that, uh, as I understand it, uh, gets deposited in the, the gizzard where it helps them uh, crush up and grind uh, the fibers of the plant material, the grain that they're eating. So chicken grit. Uh, and now what I do know about the composition of those is that of the different types, there's one that's called quartzite. Um, so that's more of a silica-based uh, sort of a, um, or I mean, it's all silica-based really, but um, primarily silica in that stone. And then there's uh, the granite grit. And that's where you see the sort of darker flecks. Uh, that's the iron and the granite. Um, uh, sort of has like a little bit of a cookies and cream kind of a, kind of a look to it there. Um, but yeah, that's, that's basically a, a decomposed uh, or crushed granite uh, type of grit. Then in the, uh, in the white vessels that have less of the black specks, that's, that's our, um, it's a crushed feldspar and the, the, my current source, the batch that I have now, uh, I bought at a ceramics supply store rather than as, at a feed store. And that, as I understand it, it was pretty expensive. And I, I asked, you know, why is this so expensive? It's not, it's not nearly as processed as the powder, right? When we buy powdered feldspar for our glazes to melt it. Um, and they said, because when you call and order it, 
the um, the the person uh, working the front desk, uh, who's an older woman, uh, has to actually go back into the warehouse with a shovel and scoop it up out of the pile, put it in a bag, and then they send it to you. And she doesn't like doing that, so they charge you an arm and a leg for it. Uh, I don't know if that's true or not, but so um, yeah, a few different sources. Uh, but the important thing is that it not be uh, calcium based, like limestone, limestone, marble, those sorts of things have a. a if anybody out there is familiar, uh, it uh, it converts uh, when heated to calcium oxide, and then uh, then it's going to reabsorb atmospheric moisture and expand and uh, essentially. Uh, so anything that's not calcium based, limestone or marble, that kind of thing, I'll throw in there. I'm sorry, there was a second part to that question. Uh, part two was, have either of you explored using 3D printing for ceramics? Gary, you doing any 3D printing? Um, was that a question for me? I had a hard time hearing that. It's a question for both of you. Um, oh. Have either of you explored using 3D printing for ceramics? Uh, Ted has, I have not. Um, I haven't had a chance to print any clay. Uh, our director, Jeff Pulaski, uh, did get a hold of a, a 3D ceramic printer for us that, uh, that I simply haven't been able to make time uh, to explore. We've, um, COVID hit, and it was bad timing. I did have a graduate student working on it. Um, no. I don't have anybody on right now. I've done a no. and, then, and then casting uh, using a, a plastic mold making process from a, a the original. Actually, I can I'll go ahead. Here's a, a project that I have yet to, to get very far with, but this is the um, the famed Venus of Willendorf, right? An early ceramic figurine um, that I intend to make a mold of and then cast in ceramic. So this is uh, printed in ABS plastic uh, as is typical. But then this is the kind of thing that I might make a mold from and then uh, cast into ceramic. So, um, and I've done a little bit of that with my sculptural works. I didn't include any slides here because it was sort of a, um, sort of a side, side exploration uh, that I entertained for a while, but uh, not as my regular part of my practice. But I'm definitely interested in it. And I'm actually interested in what uh, 3D ceramic materials can do for, uh, the, um, for aeronautics, right? So there's a lot of um, ceramic composite uh, uh, development. Uh, I mean, I don't know a lot about it other than it, it really has to do with um, high speed ultrasound, ultrasonic uh, uh, travel. And uh, ceramic is really good at dealing with the friction and the heat that comes from that. And so informing those materials, I'd love to see rather than um, the carbon impregnated ABS plastic I see people using, I'd love to see if we can come up with something ceramic. So that's a, that's a research project that I, uh, thinking of, but have not yet found the time to uh, delve into just yet. But I'm all about it. Awesome. I would love to talk more. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk. Ksenia, uh, Ksenia uh, Gerstein has a question. Uh, Ted, what do you plan to do with the Venus figurine mold? <laughs> well, <laughs> um, it's a little bit late. I, I did not get out in front of it uh, the way I had hoped, but my idea was um, I wanted to make these as gifts. Um, so, and you know, several of you out there are, were, uh, were, were donors and patrons uh, to help us uh, acquire our Blau kilns. So the Blau kilns are these computer controlled kilns that we bought a few years ago uh, with lots of help uh, and, and contributions, financial contributions from the community. And so uh, there's a little bit of a tradition of kiln gods, where uh, this is something that we just did with the firing I did with students, where we make sort of little effigies and then put them on top of the kiln in hopes that it's a good firing to appease the gods of the kilns. And uh, one of our, our Blau kilns is named Venus. Um, and uh, sort of uh, as a tribute to um, Tanya Tandok, who is a, a student and a close friend uh, and uh, whose, whose memory the, the kiln room uh, honors, I guess I would say. Uh, anyhow, the idea was to create these figurines and then name them in, in uh, honor of, of our donors. But I let that get behind me. It's, I don't have enough hands um, 
to get all that done. So that's that's the answer to that question. But who knows now? I might have some some other projects for them. Houston, um, Gary, I think you started screen sharing again. Is that yes. what I'm seeing? Yes. Um, we have a question for both of you, I think, from Joshua Smith. Um, and he, he comments, it, it really seems like ceramics is a personal journey of exploration. Is that accurate? And if so, does it feel like a constant trial and discovery process? Well, uh, I'll start that and then Ted can elaborate. Um, it, 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 it's both. It's, it's a, it's a, I've, I have over the years found it very amazing of all the different potters very well-known potters, um, rock stars in their own world, uh, or our world, excuse me, um, who uh, gracious, graciously share with information with whatever you ask them. Oh, what kind of, uh, what kind of clay is that? I was at the Anderson Ranch um, uh, working with Pete Pinnell uh, a couple of years ago, and I asked him about a Margaret Bowles glaze. Well, he uh, got on his phone and texted Margaret and asked her about the glaze and could we have her recipe? Uh, and it's a wonderful recipe. I mixed it up at Anderson Ranch and used it and it come, it's a beautiful clay, glaze. Uh, we've had workshops, people come in, um, several workshops a year uh, and anything you ask these people, they share with you. Uh, and I must apologize for Lucy that you hear once in a while. I, I moved over to her chair so you could see me a little bit better with the sunlight. But in any case, Lucy, no. That's, I, think, I think once you have all those shares, uh, then you do go to your studio and you do work alone and you explore on your own and you find all the things that come to fruition basically on your own, but with a lot of help with others. So up to you, Ted. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, the, the, the idea of the, the personal food. Um, no. And, you know, I don't know if ceramics uh, as a practice is a personal journey any more than sort of any, any other aspect of our lives, right? I mean, we have so much uh, capacity for growth and discovery in every aspect of our lives, internally, externally, in relationships, in, in you know, any sort of challenge that we, we find. I feel like ceramics, art in general, um, and, and creative pursuits, I mean, now I'm gonna throw cooking and, and you know, any sort of creative pursuit that way as, as a, a journey of discovery in a lot of ways. It doesn't have to be, um, you know, there are plenty of people that make things and cook things that are not trying to discover something. Um, so it doesn't have to be automatically, but when we're engaged in, um, in our own life processes, I think we tend to, to turn the things that we do uh, into that. We sort of find that discovery there. No place more than ceramics. I would say that is that if you're, if you're looking for some challenges to overcome, I mean, that last image that I showed you guys, I mean, it really is um, interesting to me. I mean, I, I'm discovering, you know, that I am, I'm a mid-career artist. And, uh, and that's, that's sort of a new identity for me. I never, like, who is that? What is that? What's, what is a mid-career artist? And how are they different than the, the young punk who's coming up trying to, you know, get something to happen and make some ripples? that's not my job anymore. You know, I've got, I've got younger artists who are giving me a hard time now. So uh, I got my comeuppance, but, um, but, you know, just when I think that I've really got a handle on things and I kind of know what I'm doing, um, I have put myself in a position uh, where I don't have those familiar things that I'm, I'm you know, uh, used to using and sort of know the outcome. Um, and so, so I get a lot of failure. I worked really hard to fail this much. <laughs> And so it may seem uh, uh, counterproductive, but really I think it is part of that, um, that personal journey. You know, I can't, the trial and discovery, you know, how, how to keep it fresh. I mean, without that, I, I just, I don't see any other way, really. This was, this is a necessary part of that process um, to keep it fresh. Yeah. 
Do we have any other questions? I realize we've kind of gone over our, our hour. Um, and I do want to respect everyone's time today. Um, any last questions? We'll take one more if, if there is one. Don't want to leave anyone out. Going, going. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Don't forget uh, next week, March 10th, Barry Badgett and Robert Buck uh, will be with us at 10 a.m. And Gary and Ted, thank you so much. Um, it was it was excellent. Yeah, thanks, sir. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, thanks, thank Jana you. and Ted and Gary. Hi, Don. Thank you. you. Appreciate your participation. Hope you had a yeah. good time. Thanks, yeah, Jana. We did. You bet. You bet. Hope to see you two in person soon on campus. Awesome. At least some of our face anyway, huh? <laughs> yeah. Hi, Leslie. All right. Stay safe. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Hey, Ellie. Ask up, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Ruth. I hear you.